Scripture memory verse. Scripture memory verse this week is 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I have to say, I was looking at it in the King James, and it kind of, uh, I had it memorized already in the New King James, and now I, I look at it in the King James, and it begins to, um, it just changes a little bit, that you might be made the righteousness of God. Um, might? Yeah, it says might be made, doesn't it? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Might be made, instead of might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But anyway, so there's, there is that might. I mean, you know, we, we have to understand that, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but that um, he was made sin for us and give us his righteousness and uh, for the whole world. What is it? And you might be able says? to do that if you believe in him, but some will never believe. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Excuse me? What is it the new King James says? In the place of might. might become instead of might be made. Oh, okay. There's just two different maids in the King James, and it's become in the the second maid is become. In the um, New King James. Anybody else? Second Corinthians five twenty one, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Corinthians 5.21. Now, is that the Hallelujah Scriptures, or is that something else? The Hallelujah. Yeah, that's good. I like that. 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Good job. <clears throat> good job. Thank you. Almost forgot to quote the references last time. Uh, second time. Anybody else? You know, I hesitate where to begin at, but um, Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And this is really, you know, right in the middle of it. He's writing to them, answering questions. He's, 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 he's had some people following the Judaizers and people that are really talking bad about him. So he's having to reintroduce, or he says recommend himself up in verse 12 uh, to them. You know, and, and he says in 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us or constrains us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. I think that verse right there should be a memory verse that's on everybody's heart because the the thing that goes on in Christianity is, is we say a prayer and we think we get saved and we go on living for self. But that verse right there tells us that, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves. It's not our life. The self life needs to be dead, but we should be living for him who died for us and for them and rose again because we know that Christ rose again. The evidence that his blood was accepted as an atoning sacrifice and then in 16, he says, therefore, and that's, you know, he kind of, when you see a therefore, you look back to see what it's there for. From now on, so from, the, from the, that moment, we regard no one according to the flesh. Well, why? Because it's a spiritual God. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual life. Because we are spirits with a body right now being put on trial to how we're going to what we're going to believe how we're going to live we're not bodies with a spirit like where bodies are more important than our spirit we are spirits <laughs> that are going to live for eternity and we need to stop being fooled by the flesh fooled by the self-life fooled by the things that we see and begin to cry out to god so that he can show us the things that are not seen because it's a life of faith it's a life of faith in what we don't see in fact that's what he had said earlier and, and, and it, it, 
it's it's that's why it's so hard to jump inside of these texts. Um, in verse seven, five seven, he said, "For we walk by faith, not by sight. We're we're following God's truth by faith, by confident trust, knowing that He has eyes to see in the spiritual realm." And we're doing that, that because if you start doing it by your eyes, you begin to judge the outer appearance. You start doing, following God by your eyes and trying to complete your salvation uh, with your own works. You start counting on religious works. You start counting on what you're doing. You start counting on the dust that you make instead of believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ, the one who died and rose again. And since in Adam all died, in Christ all can live. And he says now, we don't regard anyone as flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Now he throws that in there because the Judaizers and some Gnostics are saying that Christ was never in the flesh. But we know that you have to believe that Christ was in the flesh in order to believe that he was God in the flesh. In order to be saved, you have to believe that he has come in the flesh and that he's rose again. So you, you, you can't, we know that he was born of a virgin. So he's wanting to, to also make sure that he doesn't leave that hanging when we act like, well, it's all spiritual. Because the Gnostics were teaching that God, or that Christ was never in a human form, and he was just a spirit. But, but that's why John teaches in John 1, or, or, or uh, 1 John, that's which we have touched. That's which we beheld. You know, that he wants us to know that they, he was there tangibly in the flesh and was a sacrifice for our sins. So is it, is, isn't it one of the, I can't remember which John it is, but it talks about that's how he tests for false spirits, uh, false spirits or something like that. That if he says that Christ hasn't come, come in the flesh, flesh yeah, that mm -hmm. that's false. what I was talking about. Is that they're always messing with these Gnostics who believe that that flesh was sin and that that Christ came only in the spirit and and, and all flesh is sin. So um, that's the part of the mystery of of godliness is that Christ takes our sinful flesh and he gives it righteousness and then he takes sin back upon himself and that's what we'll get to in a minute even though we know that christ came according to the flesh he was born a virgin birth and lived 30 uh years and then became an itinerant preacher for three years and then they crucified him and he died and rose again and he paid an atoning death for us it's what he was purpose that he came uh yet now we know him thus no longer because why he ascended you know, after he rose from the grave, he ascended. He seated at the right hand of the Father. He sent his spirit back. And that's how we're knowing him now. Therefore, again, right inside of a therefore, he gives us another therefore. If anyone, that's a whomsoever gospel. That's not if the elect. That's if anyone. The gospel always has to be for anyone. Is in Christ. He is a new creation. He's no longer flesh, but he's now a spiritual man, and his eyes are open, and he understands that if he's in Christ, and he comes as a babe, and he begins to learn, because old things, the flesh, and all the old knowledge, and all the old ways have passed away. All the old debt and the death have passed away. It's in the grave. One died, all died. It's all buried, and now you come up in resurrection. You rise up. You stand up. Don't know how it works, but Christ says, if you, or excuse me, Paul says in Colossians 3, 1, if you have risen, set your affections on things in heaven. And so we were born dead. When we come to know Jesus Christ and we were birthed and adopted into Christ, that is a resurrection for you and me. That's where we stand up again and, and, and we have a recovery of spiritual truth. That's what resurrection means. And then we know truth and we understand don't regard flesh anymore, but look at the spiritual behind it. There's a spiritual power. There's a spiritual kingdom behind that person's action. And then there's a spiritual God that you and I are listening to as we follow the spirit of God into all truth. So you become a, a, a new creature. You don't live like the old man anymore. You get a new heart. Old things passed away, dead. Behold, all things have become new, newness of life. It's fresh. It's new. It's like a newborn baby. You get to start over again. That's why it's called reborn or rebirth, to be born again, not of, uh, of water, not of 
blood of man, but the blood of God. It's the work of God that we would be born again. Is that a reference to baptism by any chance? No. Okay, I was thinking if, maybe if you were, it says if you be risen with Christ. The only, the only message of baptism there would be the spiritual baptism that the Holy Spirit does when he places you in by the spirit of adoption, which we cry, Abba, Father. So a person who is baptized into the body of Christ and is in Christ is no longer flesh, and now they begin to cry out to God and be dependent upon God in prayer, and the Holy Spirit leads them into all truth. Okay. But the first thing that you would do if you are born again would be to get in the water. Uh, and you have a water grave that's and you what rise I'm up. thinking it referred to was not know, here. Like the rising out of the water, you know? Yeah, not here, I would not think, but that's part of the entire life of Christ. And then 18 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, now it's interesting that the word reconciliation means an exchange. It means a restoration of the divine favor, and favor is always really looking at grace. God's grace is favor with God. Uh, and it's from a word that means to change mutually. It's from a word that means atonement. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's for us to understand that there's a reconciliation going on. It's a ministry of reconciliation. It's a gospel of reconciliation. And the only way that you can reconcile anything is when somebody dies. Somebody has to die. And Christ has died. And then he asks us to die die to self, and be born again. What are you reading, uh, Pastor? I am reading right now in 18 and 19 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And oh, then we're okay. going to go into 20 in a minute. So, but he's given us, and he's committed to us. This is not just to Paul. This is to the church. The only ministry that's really given to the church is the ministry of reconciliation, the word of reconciliation, where we go and share with others the truth of the gospel. We share, we come, we learn, we want to become, we, we want to become as little children and then grow into maturity. And you know, it, it was something that was real interesting is that it's immature Christians that cause the most problems in church. You ever notice that? Who causes the most problems in, in the house? Well, immature people. The little children that don't know how to behave. They don't have the understanding. They're not listening to the Holy Spirit. They're not following truth. They're not doing their part and pulling their weight. And then they cause the most problems and the most strain and the most attention. And that's the way it is in the church also. So we want to grow up. Uh, we want to understand these spiritual truths here and be reconciled to God uh, with this atonement. And it's, it's what he's committed to us is the word of reconciliation. Well, well, what does that mean? Now then, verse 20, we are, anytime you want to know who you are in Christ, you want to see the we are's and you are verses. Anytime Paul or the Bible is saying you are and we are, they're telling you your identity in Christ, identity as a body and identity individually. These are great verses that we need to see. And so he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent Christ. We represent his kingdom. We represent truth. We represent heaven. And, and we're supposed to be, have the, uh, the word of reconciliation on our heart. We're ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. I mean, what you, listen, there's a sacrifice that's been made to redeem everyone who is born dead, who's born under sin. And God has done this great thing where he took his only son and he, and, he, and he let him die on a cross and pour out his blood and he paid the full penalty, the full everything that needed the weight of it for sin on the cross with his blood. 
And God is saying, be reconciled. Well, how do you be reconciled? You want to make this exchange where you lay down your life. You believe this truth. You cry out to God and you receive that atonement. Why? Because he made him, God made Christ, who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I believe that happens just like the new creation. We become new creations. It happens in two different ways. One, positionally, we're, we're a new creation. Positionally, boom, it's done. Practically, we're walking that out. We're changing our mind. We have a series of repentances as we see truth. Same thing with this here, where he's making us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I like to say in Christ Jesus. I know it's using the pronoun, but I like to make sure that I say his name instead of him. I don't like a lot of the pronouns, uh, but that's who it's referring to. So the righteousness is positional. Bam, it's done. All sin paid for, past, present, and future that you will ever commit. But the righteousness, again, it's a layman's term, would mean right living before God. How many would agree that you're not perfect and right living before God? But you continually are learning what righteousness is, confessing that you have fallen short, and then he's washing and cleansing us and teaches us how to walk rightly before God. So there's a positional that's finished. But there's a practical in our sanctification that we're becoming like it. And then the final at the end of the race is the glorification. And as we become, interestingly enough, like what God called David, a man after his own heart. I like to use that because that's the significance of David who, who you have this sin recorded about him, but he was a man after God's heart, wanting to do the heart of God, even though he had this sin nature that fell short. You and I are carrying our flesh around, but our heart needs to be about being dependent upon God, looking to God, trusting in God, having courage and strength in God, and, and, and turning our hearts toward home in a way that we say, Lord, I'm a sinner. But I know you have paid for that. Train me and teach me and help me not to sin. Help me not to go back to those desires and live that way. So you're coming to him fully dependent. Anything else, you're trying to do a religious work. Anything else, you're trying to go, okay, I got these rules. I can't do this. I can't do that. And you put yourself back under religion instead of relationship with God. So the power of sin is taken, the penalty of sin is taken, and now he's wanting to take the practice of sin so that we begin to practice righteousness, turn our hearts toward him, because he's already given us his full righteousness. So Christ took all of the sin of the world upon himself. The penalty for it is what it's really referring to. He took the penalty. What's the wages of sin? Death. He died. He took all the, the, the wrath of God for every person ever born, past, present, and future. For every sin ever committed, past, present, and future. But if you don't believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you don't receive the atoning sacrifice. You have to become involved intimately with it in an exchange where you give your life for his life. Because God's already done it. He's already freely given you Christ's life. He's already freely given those who receive it the ministry of reconciliation. So you tell others that you're now living Christ's life. Only in his righteousness. You don't become Christ. But you come little lights. Matthew 5 tells us we're the light now. We don't take, we don't, you don't light a light, a lamp and put it underneath the table or underneath the peck bush, but you light that light so that everybody can see it. So now we become reflectors of the light of the world and we shine that back to others with truth, the word of, rec, word of reconciliation. And so when we look at this text, it's God pleading through us. Do you see that? God is pleading through us. Be reconciled to God. Christ is on Christ's behalf. In fact, we're ambassadors. God pleads through us. 
And, and, and what do we do? We implore people. Do you see Christians doing that? See, I don't see Christians doing that. There's an urgency. There's a call. There, we are supposed to be doing this regardless of what the world says. Why do we think that they beat Paul? Why do we think they killed the, the apostles? Because they were pleading. They were letting God implore through them. They were out being reconcilers with the word of truth. And telling people that they were sinners. And they needed a savior. And the only one that was coming was Christ. Who became sin for us. And he knew no sin. That's it. It's, it's, it's um, an amazing thing. That God would come to earth and take flesh. Tempted in every way, Hebrews 4.15 tells us. And everything acquainted with all of our grief. Everything that we ever go through. And yet, he trusted God and did not sin. He obeyed God and did not sin. And then he gives that to you and me. So that when God looks at us, he literally sees the righteousness of Christ in our account. And he's pronounced us not guilty. No shame, no guilt, no punishment. And he put it all up on Christ. And what I'd like to do, really, I know it's going to take a minute, but look at um, Leviticus 16 with me. It's going to take a minute. Um, Leviticus 16. It's referring to the Day of Atonement, uh, Yom Kippur, or the day. I think they called it Yama. What's it say in the Hallelujah Scriptures? And it's, I mean, verse 1. You can, I don't, what's, uh, no, we're not going to start in verse 1 because that's, I'll have to read the whole chapter. I think I'm going to start in verse 5. Um, but verse 1 does talk about the two sons of Aaron. Uh, if you remember, Nadab and Abihu, they were killed for bringing strange fire before the Lord's uh, altar. And uh, one of the things that's missing in the church today is the fear of the Lord. You know, it's the beginning of wisdom. We, we don't fear God, and He's given us... Uh, uh, the spirit and truth. He, t he tells us to worship him in spirit and truth. And yet we think we can just come any old way and do any old thing. And, um, and here in the, under the law, verse 5, I just want you to see the scapegoat. It's a type of Christ in the Old Testament. But watch this, verse 5. He shall take, talking about Aaron, from the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Now, a, ram, a burnt offering is always a fully dedicated. And that's who you and I are supposed to be, fully dedicated to God. Christ was and laid down his life and became sin for us, he who knew no sin. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself. See, man had to always offer a sin offering for himself first before he could atone for anybody else. And make an atonement for himself. Notice the word atonement. What does it do? at one is what we need to understand. Christ makes us at one with God again. The Old Testament, their system was a kofar. It means a covering, right? Mm. A covering. It never took away sins. It just covered them so God didn't see them and didn't have to kill you. Because the wages of sin was death. It's funny that in Proverbs 28, 13, it says that he that covers his sin shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes his sin will have mercy. Not just confessing sin, but also forsaking. That's repenting. That's turning. That's saying, Lord Jesus, help me not to keep doing that. I want to turn from my sin. I don't want to just confess that I'm a sinner. I don't want to just confess that I've fallen short. But I want you to teach my heart to be a man after your heart, a woman after your heart, and forsake my sin. Stop. That's a, that's, that's a change of mind. That's a change of direction. So here in, in, in uh, 7... He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, 
one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So the Lord gets one to burn to him and another one's going to be a scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on the on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. You have to do all the cutting up and that's the other things that he describes in other places. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Now listen to me. I believe the scapegoat represents resurrection. Standing up again. They couldn't kill a goat and then make it live. God could have. But he gives them two of them. One to represent death. And one to represent life. Resurrection. Standing up again. And this was part of their uh, law. Verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering. Which is for himself. And make atonement for himself. And for his house. And shall kill the bull as the sin offering, which is for himself, because he can't come before God unless he has first made an offering for himself. Then he shall take a censer or a little bowl full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil. So he goes into the Holy of Holies and he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony lest he die. He's going to do it just like that, lest he die. He's going to make atonement for himself. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. That means completing the sacrifice. It's perfection. And it's the, the sacrifice that allows him to be before him. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. See, the first one was for the Lord. It's for him. Bring the blood inside the veil. Now you're inside the veil twice. Do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, because of their transgressions for all their sins. So he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. See, it's a covering. They're unclean. They're being, the sprinkling is, is representative of the sacrifice, but he's still going to have to go outside and actually burn the sacrifice. And I'm trying to get to the main point I want to make and not really stay focused on that, but the scapegoat. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Notice we're all talking about the blood. The blood, life is in the blood. And when he has made, this is where I wanted to get you to. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall give the live goat, or excuse me, bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. Now notice, it's on the head. Christ is the head of all principalities and powers. All authority has been given to him. He is the head of the church. We still come and confess our sins to Christ. So that he will wash and cleanse us and consecrate us and for his good service. And that's what he was doing this for. He's, it's, 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 it's a transference of the sin. It's a transference of the guilt of the sin of the man first and then for the whole nation. And that's the way it is in the, in the um, doctrine of imputation is what we say. Or the doctrine of justification. He imputed, didn't count our sin against us and give us Christ's righteousness and justified us by faith. 
just as if we never sinned. But this scapegoat is the same thing. He's confessing it on the head of the goat, and then he sends it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. Christ was a suitable man. He was the God-man. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to the uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting and shall take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his body with water in a holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer the burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. I mean, I could go on and on and on and on and read this, but the scapegoat is Christ. He became our scapegoat. He took our sin. He became sin. I mean, and you see, one of them had to die. And, and it's the way all the Kofars were in the Old Testament. But it was all pointing to Jesus Christ. It was all pointing to the time when the Lamb of God would come and take away, bring perfect forgiveness for the sins of the world. And all who believe that in their heart and confess it with their mouth shall be saved. You can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And now we begin to be the witnesses the ones who have the word of reconciliation to others. And that's what you tell people is that a sacrifice has been made for your sins. But many people don't know they're sinners because we're afraid to talk about that today. Why would I? Well, it's like having a cure for cancer and going, here, I got the cure for cancer for you. Well, I don't have cancer. Oh, okay. They don't see the significance. And that's why we tell them the truth of the word of God. Just like Mike was talking about earlier about his friend that didn't believe that a child was born in sin with a sin nature that needed to be reconciled to God. And so if they don't believe that, then one of the really interesting things is, is when you're talking to somebody, you still tell them the truth. But if they don't believe it, you see that God might not be working there right now. You're just planting some seeds. You're just getting some seeds to grow. And when other things happen in their life where the Holy Spirit's working on them, then they begin to put these thoughts together and they begin to think and God can speak to them. But their conscience has to have the word of reconciliation mentioned to them. And they're not comfortable with it. People that are like we used to be, I was never comfortable with it. And you were probably never comfortable with it. You thought you were okay because now you have to do something with your conscience. You have to change. And most people think that they have to work their way into goodness so they can come to God. They just need to come to God and then He begins to work the righteousness in you and train you to have a heart for Him. But He does, he does positionally give you an inheritance in heaven. And now you need to turn your eyes toward it. Turn your heart toward it. And ask God what that identity means. And how do I grow? How do I go? And how do I uh, bring God glory with my life? And it's the word of reconciliation. It looks different in all lives. But it's always going to be with the word of truth. It's always going to be in handing out the truth of the gospel. And it has to be done, I think, from moment to moment with the wisdom of God because he knows the heart that's coming into your life the person the soul and he will um, use you for his glory in that time if you're a person after God's own heart so he made him who knew no sin Christ was sinless he didn't know sin he had no sin to be sin for us that we might become or might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Are you being transformed? Are you being made the righteousness of God? It's not that we're sinless, but we begin to sin less. And we're learning to walk rightly before God more and more every day. And we're choosing to obey the Spirit. We're choosing to obey God. Because we've been brought back underneath the authority of God and we've accepted the sacrifice for when we were not underneath the authority of God and we had said no to God. That's what the sin nature does. It always says no to God. 
But think about this for a minute. Much of the church does not read the word of God, so they don't know the will of God, and they don't know what God's required of them, so they think they're okay with God, even though they're not making that series of repentances which turns their heart toward God. So, age-old question. Do they lose their salvation, or did they ever have it? Again, it doesn't matter. If they go to hell, they go to hell. And you and I have been given the word of reconciliation. And the word is, is that Christ died and paid for the sins of the world with his blood. And he rose again. And he's coming back to take those who believe that and come underneath his authority home to live with him for eternity. And then he's going to judge and he's going to cast everyone who rejects that word of reconciliation, rejects the exchange of Christ's life for your life. If you reject that exchange, you will be cast into hell because the wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God forever, forever and ever and ever. Everybody that's ever born has eternal life. The question is, are you going to receive the payment for your um, sin nature and receive the righteousness of Christ and spend eternity with God? Or are you going to go on in your own esteem, continue to live for yourself, and reject that exchange that God has given to His only Son, Jesus Christ? Because He made Him who knew no sin, He made Christ who knew no sin, had committed no sin to be sin for us, to take the punishment of sin for us, that we might become. It's a a choice that you have to make. And you choose Jesus when he tells you, by the power of his spirit, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Next week's verse, 1 John 1, 9. That if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice again with me, when you agree with God with the exchange, there's two things that are happening. Forgiveness imputed to us, but then he's also cleansing us from all unrighteousness we might be made to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus learning to be cleansed clean our heart up and walk rightly before almighty God saying yes and yes and amen amen